so thank you all for joining us. And my name is Adam Graham. I know some of you um, know me. I run a, a business development consultancy called Gray Matters. Um, and today we're going to be looking less on the new business side, but more about client agency um, relationships, because obviously when you get that right, uh, it eases the pressure on your business and it leads to better retention, client growth, um, cost savings and general happiness for both the agencies and the clients. Um, so as we know, all great work is built on the foundation of great relationships. And, you know, it's, it's people that can inspire one another, provide balance, um, watch each other's backs and, and be a, a true comrade. And together, you know, someone who, who can share your vision, cover your blind spots and celebrate those wins and those hard times are all some of the sort of positive attributes to, to good client agency relationships. Um, but we know that not all of your relationships may tick those boxes. So today we want to sort of work through how, how you assess them, how can you improve them um, and how can you ultimately walk away from them if you need to. Um, so today I'm joined by a great lineup uh, to explore the topic um, and we've got quite a few perspectives covered within that. So we've got Andy West, who is Group Chief Development Officer at Hotwire um, and we'll, we'll be doing proper introductions shortly, um, but he's, he's there. And then we've got Annabel Dunstan, who is founder and CEO at Question and Retain. Hi, Annabel. Uh, Kate McFerrin is director of communications at LNER. And Malik Akhtar is the vice president of marketing procurement at Bayer. Um, so we've got uh, questions for all of them. Um, if you feel, if you've got questions yourself, please, you know, feel free to put them into the chat or, you know, we will unmute you and you can ask your question directly to the panel. Um, and we've got the, the, the session we've kind of structured into four areas where we've looked at managing, measuring, pitching and procurement. And, you know, it will hopefully flow seamlessly between the four. Um, and we've also got a couple of poll questions, which I will um, put live throughout the session and, and get some sort of live um, feelings uh, and, and thoughts uh, that we can all sort of respond to in real time. Uh, so that's it from me. So we're gonna kick off with, I've asked each of the speakers to share a, a short story, um, which sort of encapsulate, encapsulates a key learning through their career and their experiences. Um, so I'll start with you, Andy, if you're, you're happy to, uh, to jump in. Yep, thank you very much, Adam, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, this, I think, is a it's a fascinating topic because obviously it's the lifeblood of, of any of any agency. How do we how do we keep our clients happy, um, and how do we grow our clients? And I think you know it's something that every agency right now is focused even more on than, than ever before. Every every single client relationship is absolutely essential. Um, so I've been in this game for over thirty years now, and I've had hundreds of different client relationships. Um, and through that time, there's, there's a, a few things that I've kind of noticed um, and sort of experienced that perhaps have informed the way that I think today in trying to keep and grow all of the clients that we have at Hotwire. Um, my sort of little anecdote dates back to when I was a, uh, uh, an account manager in my 20s, working for a small technology uh, consultancy based in Ealing. And we had a one of our largest clients was a uh, relational database vendor. Um, I probably ought not to say their name, although I don't even know if they're around now. Um, but we were very proud to represent this company. And as a sort of 26 year old, um, I thought I knew everything um, and I had an ego to match. Um, so when I used to have regular conversations with the managing director of that uh, organization, we had a great relationship and I thought I was the um, kipper's bits that I had this relationship with this ma managing director. Um, and I remember very clearly um, going to lunch with him one day with a journalist um, and in the days when you could have lunch with reporters and it all went very, very well. I think it was a national reporter. So I was really proud that I'd managed to land this opportunity for Malcolm. Um, and at the end of the lunch, the reporter Julie left and we were doing a wrap up and just as we were leaving he said to me Andy I'd love you to just give me a call um, in a few days time if that's all right I'd love to have just a chat with you and off he went and I kind of bounced off down the street thinking he's just going to tell me how great I am he's going to probably offer me a job do I want to go in house is it time for me to you know move to the to the dark side um, and I kind of then moved on to other stuff. And then 
forgot about ringing the MD um, until about three weeks later, where I get a phone call from his um, his his uh, secretary saying, "Andy Malcolm would like to talk to you." Great, okay, yeah. So, hi Malcolm, how are you doing? And he actually wanted to fire us because he wasn't happy with the way that the relationship was going. Um, and so, I guess my my uh, learning from that, albeit 20 odd years ago, is don't ever let your ego get in the way and make sure that you've got the right amount of transparency, honesty, um, and never ever become complacent with a client, no matter how informal you might feel you are with that client. Always remember they are a client and never ever be so arrogant as to think that you are getting everything right all of the time. You've got to be having those very transparent conversations all of the time. And as Andy Grove, the founder of Intel said, and it's, it's been a, a mantra that I've kept throughout my entire career, only the paranoid survive. Um, and I'm paranoid about every single client relationship. I want to make sure that every client is happy. So don't let ego get in your way. Oh, I think you're on mute, Adam. I was saying thanks, Andy. <laughs> um, very, very interesting. And uh, yeah, I like that. But especially because you can get very close to clients and then obviously, um, yeah, you can get complacent within that as well, can't you? Um, so Annabelle, if we go to you next um, with your story, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, thanks, Adam. And welcome to everybody. I can see one or two of our clients in the mix there. So please be assured anything I talk about will be completely anonymized and non-attributable to you. Um, so I've had a very... Um, privileged career in that I've spanned all the different parts of this whole mix so I've been in-house in marketing and PR for Gulf Air originally and then had a long track record through agency life and then ended up building a company which has been around for about a decade now measuring the whole client agency relationship so really interesting and really humbling to come out of agency world and then actually to have a a deep dive into every agency culture you can imagine from the small two, three man bands to the global nationals that we, um, uh, and international companies we've got on the line today. So really interesting. And as an anthropologist, um, I think I've really found my niche because I'm really interested in getting under the skin of what people think. And Andy opened with saying that it's really important that clients are, are happy and that you can grow them. And I'd add to that is that it's really important right now as well, particularly during COVID, is to really understand your client and to understand what their pain points are. And a lot of, a lot of what we do is really trying to help agencies to understand what their clients are feeling and thinking um, throughout the year. And so we help identify brand ambassadors, people who are really happy about your business right now, that they'll recommend you, or what we call latent grumblers, um, those that perhaps are sitting on the fence, not quite sure whether it's going to continue or not. But the story I wanted to tell you, um, Adam and I discussed before um, the call, what is it that would be interesting? And there's a side effect measuring client satisfaction or the client agency relationship, which is that it can help you as an agency leader to understand who your underperformers are. And I wouldn't set out that as a key objective of measuring clients that, but it can be a, a useful byproduct because if you go out to all your client base, often a client will, and I'll see if Kate and Malik back this up, but perhaps say a little more online uh, by email than they perhaps might face to face. It's perhaps it's a terribly British thing, I'm not sure. Um, but those clues that your clients are giving you when they feed back through an online way in particular, um, can just start to put the pieces of the puzzle together for you to identify um, someone who perhaps isn't quite um, giving you the, the right story of what's really going on. So this happened with a, a global agency a number of years back. Uh, and when we uh, pieced together three or four uh, client teams, we realized that there was a weak link sitting amongst that, um, that the clients were feeding at a very granular level, very small things, but all of it was adding up. Um, and in fact, when that feedback came back, part of our role was to feed that back in a very diplomatic way, but nevertheless, uh, no egos, no politics in the room when we come in. Um, and it clearly showed up that this particular individual was doing a very good job of PRing themselves internally upwards and, es and not escalating the problems that they were actually handling and firefighting. And whilst there were small things, as I said, the, the culmination of that meant that one of those three clients that had fed back was on the verge of putting it out to tender. So working with the client, we were able to say, well, here are the, the, here are the small things that are happening that this client is picking up on. Let's look at what other clients have said as well, put that all together 
and put that into a training program for that individual. And in fact, we helped them to turn it around and that client was saved and it was a, a, a big one. <laughs> so it is, a, it is a byproduct to be able to identify underperformers within your own team. But clearly the bigger part is, as Andy said, it's about um, understanding the satisfaction and how you can grow that client through really understanding them. There's so much more I want to say on this, but we'll have time through the call. But um, yeah, look out for underperformers by understanding what your clients really think about your services. Yeah, we'll, we'll be certainly coming back back to that. And I think it's a weakness we see in, in a lot of agencies, um, you know, that, that we come across as well. Um, so let's jump to you, Kate, um, and make an introduction and, and tell us your story. Oh, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Um, this is a topic very close to my heart. Um, my background is a mix of agency and in-house. I've done about 50-50 uh, of both, and I've enjoyed all of my experiences, both agency and in-house, and, and I think it's great to be able to blend a lot of the key learnings. Um, my story is, is, is similar to Andy's in some way, in that um, when I was uh, I had just joined an agency, uh, and it was uh, my task to come in and build this great new practice and I was all very excited and there was a few few really great clients to, to start us off with so it was all looking very good and uh, very very excited. Day four um, we had a meeting uh, with the new managing director of one of these clients and so we, we brought in all the, the big guns or you know I was a partner at the agencies all the other partners came in and we sat around the table and the client proceeded to sack us. And this was on my fourth day. So <laughs> it wasn't exactly the great start that I was looking for. Um, it was also uh, our second biggest client for the agency. So this was not voting well for building a new team with, you know, a huge, and we were on about 30 days notice. So it really wasn't the start that I was looking for. Anywho, so we, we sat down and we really just tried to listen and unpick what were the issues. And the managing director was quite new. So what she was doing was, I guess, passing on the feedback that she had had from her own team about how they had felt working with our, our account team in this agency. And, and as hard as that, and it was a truly difficult meeting, I, you know, I, I remember very clearly afterwards, we all kind of wandered out of this building thinking we were going to have a great meeting, meet the new MD, it was all going to be great. And here we were given our notice and we all kind of slumped and sat in the prep at Hoban <laughs> thinking, oh no, what do we do now? And it was actually one of the best meetings that we had because they were sharing with us the pain points. What were all the things that hadn't worked and that, that wasn't, wasn't helping them as a business and particularly for the sum that, that they were paying us. And that's the gold dust. And that, that has, has been for me a real key learning is around find the gold dust. And I think it's about the feedback that you sometimes get. It won't always be you know, easy to hear, but it's going to be the thing that's going to help you create and provide more value, whether it's to your client or if you're in-house to your business. So it's gold dust. And, and as, as difficult as it sometimes is to see the team take that on board, it's about being tenacious, dusting yourself off and, and taking that forward. What can we do? We did end up turning that around. We got the client to uh, extend with us for another month and then another month. And then I pitched for more budget, which they gave us. And in the end, you know, we ended up having them for you know, more than another 12 months and something like a quarter of a million extra pounds that we got out of it that we weren't, weren't planning to ever get. So you can turn it around and actually make it, you know, a really, um, I guess, positive experience. Uh, so I think that that's been my key learning. Just look for the gold dust, find it and use it. Definitely, find, find the gold dust. Um, so great, so we've obviously got stay paranoid, identify weaknesses, find the gold dust. So Malik, over to you then to uh, encapsulate your, your learnings. Perfect. Well, first of all, I'm really delighted to hear Andy and Kate share a couple of examples where procurement weren't the people wheeled out to fire the agency, because that happens more than we would like. So, so um, hi, and thanks for involving me in, the, in this group as well. Delighted to, to be here today. Um, I've really always done procurement. So about the last 20 years, I've been involved in procurement and most of that in marketing procurement. And I think the story that I'd like to share is one of the most common um, situations that we find ourselves in is pitches. And a lot of them kind of blur into one, if I'm very honest with you, but there are a few that stick out, some for good and some for not so good reasons. 
um, whether it's some of the gimmicks and the things that you get as gifts from the agencies, which um, is felt will sway your opinion. Um, some very bizarre umbrellas and cakes amongst all those gifts that have appeared over the years. Um, but the one story I wanted to, to dig into a little bit was um, one where we tried really, really hard to remove some of those gimmicks and the kind of the showmanship, if you like, from, from the pitching process um, to make it a little bit more of an objective process and, and really how we went probably a bit too far. So um, this goes back a long time. So I'm sure that I won't offend anybody on the call. So if I do, I apologize um, in advance. But um, we did essentially an anonymous pitch process because we didn't want the identity of the agencies or the people within the agencies to sway the decision of the marketeers that were making the ultimate decision. So we sent them a brief. We got the brief response to be displayed on boards, which were all anonymized, and we got people to to evaluate them. We obviously did all the commercial negotiations and discussions in the background as as we should, and it led us to um, what on paper was a fantastic agency. They nailed the brief. They produced a really compelling um, insight and creative link to it, and then the executions were also very strong. So great signed the contract, brought them in, they were on the roster. Um, the only problem was the people. So actually what we'd overlooked was actually the importance of chemistry in the pitching process and actually not only getting people that are really, really good at what they do, but also people that you like and you would want to work with. Um, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about that more as the, in the session today as well. Um, and as a result, they were on the roster but they never did a single piece of work for us because they couldn't um, get an individual project. So that was a key learning for us. Interesting. And probably not, not an expected story to come from the procurement uh, side, side of the fence, but uh, <laughs> it's important. That's, and, that's, uh, and that's what we're here to discuss, I think, and, 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 and debate. But uh, I think they're all about, you know, not, not running from the, uh, from, from the truth, um, those stories. So it's about, you know, I, embracing that and, and, and sort of, um, you know, going head on with what, what needs fixing essentially. Um, cool. So look, if we, if we go uh, over to you, Andy, to, to kick things off then with some of these, these questions. So um, a lot of the agencies that, that we come up uh, across sort of struggle to, to be more strategic in the work and the, the way they serve as clients. So, I guess one of my questions for you is that how can agencies become sort of better consultants and not be seen as kind of these commoditized suppliers? That's, I think, one of the most important aspects of this profession moving forward. We, we actually, there is a whole other debate around should we stop calling ourselves agencies and call ourselves consultancies? Um, it's something we've gone through at Hotwire in some detail over the last 12 months. Um, and we're making a very concerted effort to upskill all of our people as consultants. And we've done that by um, unpicking what we do and rebuilding it into a playbook, into what we call the Hotwire Way. And the first step of that Hotwire Way is discovery. Um, and it's only really, I think, by asking the right questions and for um, consultants within the profession to be inherently curious um, and to ask the right questions to really understand what it is their client is looking to achieve and to go through that process with some degree of discipline before you start throwing out creative ideas or getting tactical. What, I, what I've seen over the last, gosh, 25 years of pitching is so many times, and we've been guilty of this, you know. It's the um, wrong place. <laughs> pardon? I think it was someone else on the line, don't worry. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I was getting, getting heckling. I wasn't quick enough to, uh, to, to, put, to put it down. No, but what I was going to say was that, you know, um, I think what happens in the PR industry more uh, in, you know, to, to a greater or lesser just degree is um, client goes through pitch process, client appoints new agency, new agency then jumps on what I call the hamster wheel of activity immediately. In other words, they just start doing what the old agency was doing, but perhaps with just a different, uh, you know, slant to it what the agency hasn't done is gone into the client and really, really sought to understand what is it are they trying to achieve? Um, and I think that's the difference then between an agency and a consultancy. Spending time up front to really understand not just the business objectives, 
of the client, but also the communication objectives so that you understand what is the change that we're trying to effect through the communications that we're doing rather than just jumping on that hamster wheel of tactical activity and doing what was being done before. And I think if we can do that, then we can truly become the consultants that this profession has talk, long talked about becoming. And if we do that, as um, you know, the PRCA has talked about, um, then we can start to also command the sorts of um, fees and also, dare I say, the sorts of salaries that are commensurate with others in the professional services industry. So I think there's a, you know, it's an interesting discussion about how do you become more consultative? And I think it's to do with upskilling and also that old adage that we have two ears and one mouth. I think too many of us, and I'm probably guilty, love the sound of our own voices when we're with clients. We don't ask enough questions and we don't do enough listening. Yeah, no, that's definitely. And, and, and Annabelle, do you, do you see the same, you know, agencies trying to move to becoming more, having that sort of partner status and, I guess one of the pushbacks to, you know, or, or difficulties I think people overcome is how do you get clients to open up and be more transparent um, to, to sort of have that, that conversation? Oh, hold on. Thank you. You're yeah. keeping me muted. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. In fact, I wanted to bring in an example. One of the top five accountancy firms we worked with um, spotted this whole area around the fact that, being, as they call them, bean counters were going to become obsolete with AI in the coming years. So actually, they moved their whole um, uh, four and a half thousand staff to become um, coaches and consultants to themselves and then into their clients. So in a way, a lot of the PR functions you know, AI is a threat to some of those. So actually upskilling your staff to be the part that AI can't um, um, replace. So being a true consultant is really spot on. And it, it's something I absolutely advocate when we talk to, to leadership teams. You need to get your juniors thinking about what questions should we be asking that cuts through. You don't want to be an agent that just jumps when the client says jump. You want to challenge, probe, question, really get under the skin and become very commercially um, aware of what your, your client's business is all about and how you're gonna help those business objectives. So yes, becoming a true partner, it, it comes through trust and time and experience, really getting under the skin of what your client's pain points are. I think Kate used that phrase, absolutely. Um, and only then can you start to call yourselves a partner. It's just like a relationship, you know, you start out, there's a dance around it but each interaction you have should build trust, deepen, deepen that understanding between you. Hmm. What about early on in that relationship? You know, I think sometimes agencies start off um, with clients in, in one direction or maybe start off maybe more subservient in, in throughout the pitch process because they want to win that work and it's so important to them to win that work. But then obviously that relationship needs, needs to change over time. Um, I don't know if you, Kate or Annabelle, if you've, is there anything that say, agencies need to learn when they when we first kick off those relationships? I would move away from the word subservient. Um, I was once quoted by, I think it was the deputy editor of the News of the World in a meeting. He said that Annabelle, she blushes like a virgin in a whorehouse, but she's as tough as those old boots she wears. <laughs> <laughs> and I think clients really wow. You've got to say the truth. You know, yes, there's all that chemistry and it's got to feel good and you've got to build rapport. But really, clients are paying you tens of thousands of pounds to say how it is. And that's really important. And, you know, I've given Andy's been a client of ours for a long time and I've told him how it is sometimes. <laughs> and it's really important. And a true friendship or a true relationship has to have truth as its kernel. So I think subservient is is old school and I wouldn't as a client want a, an agency to be fawning to me so I'm going to put you I down. I completely agree I think um, you, you use that first time you're going to be in that honeymoon period as well you know that the, the clients just decided that you know they're going to back you that, that they're the ones you know you're the ones that they want to work with and so use that time to get to know the business you know think outside of the brief as well um, I think the more you get to really get under the skin of what the business is doing, not just whether it's the marketing team or the communications team that you're working with, who, whichever part, 
the more you can use that insight to go back with exactly what Annabelle's talking about, the kind of the, the friendly challenge to say, well, hang on, this is something that I've observed. This is what I think. Now, that might not be something that's in the brief, but it could actually be the one, uh, I guess, um, external set of fresh eyes looking at the business um, with, with a completely independent perspective. You won't necessarily get from within the business. So make the most of that. Um, and I think if provided that you're providing value to the business, then that's how you build that trust to become that trusted advisor. Uh, but I think it's it's not about feeling the pressure of, well, we've got to quickly tap dance and, and reinforce that it was a good decision. They've made the decision. They want you. Show them why it was a good decision. Mm -hmm. Just more recently, Kate, it's just interesting with, with, with COVID. How, how has it sort of recently affected, you know, some of the relationships um, you know that you've been you've had with your agencies yeah it's been uh it, it has been difficult because we have had to completely uh throughout this pandemic really shift our focus where um you, at the start of this year and and uh, what is very germane to our business is trying to get people to enjoy their journey on on our on our trains you know we've just introduced a whole new fleet of very modern lovely sleek trains we want people out to, you know traveling between london and scotland enjoying the views exploring these great destinations having a great time and then came lockdown we effectively had to try and kill off our business model by saying well look please don't please don't travel with us unless you're unless you're a key worker or Oh, we've lost Kate. Oh, is that Kate we've lost? I thought I thought lost me. Are you, the rest of you there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, fine. We'll come back to Kate. Malik, um, I'm interested in your perspective on, on sort of the relationship side. So we'll come on to talk about pitching and procurement a bit later. But what about, um, you know, wh where, where does your involvement sort of start if there's, um, you know, is it is it a proactive thing in terms of how you're assessing the, the relationships? Or do you get called in when you know, shit hits the fan, to put it bluntly. <laughs> it's a lovely phrase. Um, I think it I think it varies. And I think it, you know, if I'm very honest, you know, it, it depends on um, the extent to with which the procurement team are integrated into the, the, the marketing areas that they're supporting, how much effort they make to really understand what it is that the marketing teams are doing, what the agencies are doing to support them. Because at its heart, you know, and, and very much aligned to, to Annabelle's thoughts, it's about brokering the best relationship um, between the agencies and the marketing teams. Um, and we would approach it the same as we would any negotiation, which is trying to find the common ground between um, the two parties. And, and if I think about, you know, what we've just discussed a little bit, um, that you know, some agencies are motivated by doing really, really good work. Um, by producing famous campaigns, winning awards. Other agencies are just um, are more concerned about um, revenue. Uh, and then you have every kind of spectrum in between. Um, it's about trying to understand what's the right um, match of agency to the clients and the brands that we have. Because in some cases, you're absolutely right. You know, we talked about having strategic insight and support and helping us to crack some of those real business problems that we've got. But there are equally some sometimes where we just need a piece of work done and actually we don't need lots of strategic um, support and it's being able to identify the right agency partnership in the right um, situation and by being involved in things like budget planning business planning cycles with your brand teams will help you get a much better understanding of what those requirements are so that you can do that matchmaking exercise and match them up with the right agency agency partners to do that and, and how, so how do you go about assessing what each department needs? Is it, you know, do you sit down sort of regularly to do that? Or is it, they flag concerns? Yes. Yeah, so, so, I mean, we, we obviously, we try and get it documented in a brief or in a scope of work. Uh, that in itself can be a challenge, mm. um, you know, trying to get them to actually, to, to, to be very specific about, about what they need. Or, even if they don't know precisely what they will need for the brand is maybe to try and break it into component parts. So Andy talked about the consultancy approach. Maybe the first thing that you need or your first project, if you like, is a piece of consultancy from your agency. It's actually help me think about the strategy for the next period. Help me determine what should go into a brief. 
rather than writing some something which is very vague and very open ended and obviously um gives huge room for interpretation um when a, a proposal's been put together. So Yeah, definitely. Um Kate, are you back? Hopefully Kate can hear us. Um Oh, not not too sure. Andy, we'll come on to let's talk about sort of managing some of the relationships that you know you you obviously have to manage a lot of global relationships and and put in place best practice for the clients. So, what you know, what processes or, or best practice do you put in place, or can you recommend agencies put in place um, to service clients and ensure they don't over service as well? Mm, yeah, um, there's a little bit of, of art and science, I think. Um, I mean. If you're if you're in the public relations industry, if you're in communications, then you you typically are, are a sort of person who ought to be able to build and maintain close relationships with most people. So I think the the art part of it is you know just the art of, of relationship, um, which is is all about you know listening, constant communication, um, you know not going quiet on your client for a period of time, checking in, not being afraid to ask the right questions. Not being not being afraid to ask, you know, um, for feedback as well. I think as a as an industry and almost as a generation, we're sometimes quite shy about asking for feedback, um, and that's where you know Annabelle's has been you know brilliant for us in in making sure that we go back and ask all of our clients for feedback on a very regular basis. And when it comes back, it can be you know it can be quite tough to take, um, but unless you ask for that feedback, then you don't know that there could be that problem. The grumblers, I think Annabelle calls them, those people who perhaps are just uh, not that happy, but don't really want to confront anything. Um, and they're the most dangerous type of client, frankly, where you think everything's right. So I think there is a lot of, of, of art around it, the art of the relationship. I think the science comes into it, um, particularly with global clients, where we build uh, annual account plans um, for all of our major global clients. Um, and those account plans do look at areas, you know, expected revenue, service portfolio, Team, team composition, um, client satisfaction, where, where were they last year? What areas were they, have they highlighted? And we really put a lot of effort into those client plans and we revisit those formally with the team globally on a quarterly basis. And I report back to our, the global leadership team, the six of us on the GLT at, at Hotwire, uh, once a month for all of our top 10 clients, just to look in and just have that sense check as to how are we doing you know, are they on you know traffic light system, red, amber, green? Um, and if they're on green, fine. If they're on red or amber, then you know why? What are we doing about it? So I think that's the science part of it. I think there is a lot of process that you can build into the agency client relationship. Um, but unless you've got that relate that relationship part right and the chemistry part right, um, and the understanding of what the client is looking for. And I'm, I was interested, you know, Malik's point there about sometimes you just want an agency to get stuff done that's absolutely fine i think what we need from it from the agency side is that needs to be made very clear because our kind of dilemma is that we are pushing very hard to drive people to think like consultants um and that's an ongoing and an iterative process people don't become consultants overnight so when they're presented with a we need to do this that can actually become a little bit like a piece of grit in the shoe. It starts to irritate and get worse because if we're constantly pushing back, well, why do you need to do that? Why do you need to do it now? What do you need to achieve? And actually the client just says, you know what, just please, we just need that done. And I think that's where that relationship is really important so that you can have that honest conversation um, and keep the client happy and look for an opportunity maybe next time where, as Malik says, actually we do need that consultancy. Um, or come back with ideas. So art and science, I think, Adam, is, is you know, for us is where it comes down to. You can put a lot into process, but you've also got to be pretty good at the relationship side. Mm. It's almost flipping between being an agency and then being, being a consultant at different times, but knowing exactly how the, the client sort of wants to sort of treat you um, in, in that regard. How far um, can you push back? What's that, sorry? How far can you push back? Come yes. Um, so, uh, Kate, obviously, uh, uh, welcome back. So, um, yeah, just thinking about some of your relationships. And I mean, do you work with agencies on a kind of retained basis or, or a project basis? And, or is it a complete mix of the both? And, and maybe could you tell us a bit about the benefits you see of working in those two different ways? 
Mm, yeah, sure. Um, apologies, um, where our Wi-Fi is uh, playing some tricks on us today. So we're, fortunately, we're um, a lot better at running trains than we are at running our Wi-Fi. Um, so we have a combination of, uh, of uh, retained. The retained is more so on the marketing side and then on the communication side. We really shifted away from retainer and more to project based. Uh, we have been building the internal capacity of our team. So we almost act like an in-house agency to the rest of the business. And that allows us to really work with, um, I guess, experts in particular areas. So for example, at the moment we're working with a consumer PR agency on a, on a really great project around environment. And it really helps us to play to their strengths and then combine that with our own, own team strength in, in working with the rest of the business and our audiences. So. That's where we've we've shifted. We've shifted to where it makes sense. We have the retained agencies. I think on the marketing side, it, it obviously makes sense. And also the size of those contracts are you know quite substan substantial when you've got you know media spend in there. So that makes sense. Uh, but elsewhere in the business, we have shifted more to, to project. And, and so those relationships are really important because they are, you hear it a lot, this, you know, you need to be an extension of the client's team. And they generally are for us. Um, they are just like any other member of our team. We welcome them in. And uh, it, it, and that, you know, we, we started out this discussion talking about the importance of that, that chemistry. Malik gave a perfect example of when you don't get to meet the people, you don't understand the chemistry of those relationships. And it's absolutely vital, I think, um, in, in underpinning great work is, is great relationships. Mm. And, and to build that chemistry, you know, I don't know if you guys have any advice is that just something that comes over time is that you know can you put processes in place to build chemistry um and I'm, I'm sure chemistry might never never be there and it's all quite natural but you know to to encourage it to happen or to at least um you know discover if there is any chemistry well i'm happy to take that um i think it's encouraging everybody in the team to really become quite curious about the client who they're working with day in, day out. You spend a lot of time, I mean, particularly now with Zoom calls, there's never been a better time to really get under the skin of what your client's life is all about. You can see in the background whether they play saxophone or have a cat, whatever it might be. But those little touch points really help humanize the working relationship. And when the proverbial, I'm gonna use the word proverbial, Adam, hits the fan, then you've got that to fall back on, you've got that trust, that, that friendship as well as um, business relationship that can catch when things go wrong. So we're working with a new American client at the moment and knew nothing about her. And within six weeks, I now know her whole family set up, what she loves doing, that she's a singer. And those that connection and showing interest in someone, and it's genuine, I'm not doing it just because I want to have a good client relationship. It, it has to come from a place of authentic interest in people mm -hmm. so encourage your extroverts in your agency teams to really use those skills you know applaud them reward them encourage them to really get to know who they're working with and that will pay dividends over and over yeah and I think you know that might be you know and I think that's easier done on a sort of more senior level and I think maybe on a sort of more junior level it's how do you maintain those levels of curiosity um and and genuine interest but I think you know obviously COVID has changed that a lot and, and highlighted um, different ways of working um, I know with you Andy is like how in terms of virtual working how's that sort of impacted uh, your client relationships and you know how have you managed to sort of you know continue with those strong bonds has it been, has it been easier or have you had to put in place new processes to enable that um, I, I no I don't think it's made it any easier um, I think we are great believers in 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 face to face, um, and I don't think, unfortunately, we're not going to be going back to the office anytime soon. And, and then I think even when we do, it's going to be in a very different world. Um, but actually, I think face to face is is essential. Um, but I'll just go back to the previous point, if I may, Adam, just around mm -hmm. chemistry. And I think this starts at the at the pitch stage. And I think, and I, you know, again, I'm very interested with Malik's example. Um, I think agencies you've got to be ready to walk away when you know that the chemistry is just not right. Um, we've got to be brave as an industry and, and walking away from a pitch. We, you know, we, ha we have a mantra. I've got a mantra that we, you know, we, we pitch less, but we win more. I'd rather pitch for you know, three bits of business and win three bits of business than pitch for 10 bits of business and only win three, you know, because 
if it's not right, it's not right. And you typically know that it's not right when you have that briefing call. It may be, you know, the way that the, the client talks to you. It may be their attitude towards the work that they're asking you to do. You can just, you just know that this is not going to be the sort of relationship that anybody is going to be wanting to maintain. And it's really important from an agency perspective that you've got the courage to walk away because at the end of the day, we are a people business. And, you know, with the greatest respect to, to Kate and to Malik, you know, if you've got a crappy client, then, and it is about revenue, then what's going to, the, the, the loser in all of this is going to be your team and your team will walk away from your agency. So the agency becomes the loser. Mm. And our job is to hire and retain the best talent in the industry. And that means working with clients that inspire them and that they enjoy working with. And if you've got a client who's frankly an asshole, then you don't, you don't need that and you're not going to keep your people. So the chemistry piece in the pitch process is so important. And I, I, we relayed this story, Malik, when we spoke in the, in the, the, uh, the, the setup, you know, pitching a particular large software company fairly recently and procurement had said to the, uh, the, the client side, you cannot engage with the agency. You must not answer questions. You can't meet with them. You can't speak with them. And we just, you know, it just, it, it was, they're on a road to nowhere because that chemistry piece, you just couldn't work it out. And I'm glad to say we didn't win that pitch um, because I don't think it would have been fulfilling. So I just want to raise that. I think agencies need to be braver. And I, you know, and when clients, and the same with clients, you know, we've, we've, we've had clients walk away from us in credential stage and just say, you know what, hot wire, I don't think you're the agency for us. Fine. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we've tried it. We've sat down. We don't like each other. Let's part now rather than part three months or six months down the road. So chemistry is super important. Yeah, no, def definitely. You know, we, it's, it's, it's something we don't see enough really from agencies, do we, or, you know, to, to walk away. And even, even beyond that, sometimes when we talk to agencies, it's about positioning themselves and actually understanding who their, who their ideal clients are and who do they want to work with. And often it's just anybody who will give them money, you know, and it, it, it's, there's not enough thought that goes into that. So even when they're sitting in front of a new client, they're unable to ascertain whether or not that's the right type of client for them because they don't know who the right client is for them. And yeah. yeah, I mean, sorry, I, I think my, my connection just had a bit of a wobble, but I think um, I have always more respect for an agency that says no rather than that says yes every time when they're invited to a pitch. Because I think from an agency's perspective, there are some very simple questions that you should always ask, and I'm sure you guys do every time you go into the process, which is why are you pitching? Yeah, what, what is the trigger for, for pitching? Who's the decision maker? What it is? Do you know specifically what you're looking for? How many people are being involved? What is the budget? And I know that's heresy from a procurement point of view, but, you know, directionally, what are we talking about? And, and you know, what are the odds of, of winning? You know, we're doing a pitch with 10 agencies involved. No, thank you very much. Yeah. And making those decisions based on the likelihood of success and whether it is a client that you that you want to work with is, is absolutely right, because it's as much about the agency interviewing the client as the other way around through the pitch process, for sure. Mm. I also add there that there's also an elegance required in how you turn down a client or how you walk away from a client because remember it's still your reputation and that client that you or that the agent the client you choose not to pitch for that marketing director or that head of procurement may well move somewhere else and actually if you've handled that with elegance and finesse and, and proper approach then they may well come back to you in their new guise so it's all about reputation how you handle the, the, the bad and the ugly. One, and one way maybe just for yeah. the, the audience to think about that is, you know, we, we start every call, every sort of new prospect call with, you know, the purpose of this call is to see whether we are the right agency for you. Um, and, you know, as you go through that call and as you ask those questions that Malik has just outlined, which I think are spot on exactly the questions that, you know, every agency needs to be asking a new prospect. At the end of that call, particularly the budget question, you know, we have, a, we have a policy that we will not pitch unless we have a budget. Um, it can be a rough budget, it, you know, just give me, a, give me some guidelines, give me some parameters. But if you don't give me a budget, I'm not going to spend time putting together a, a pitch that could be way, way out of your budget range, or it could be way, way too small for your ambitions and your, and your pocket. Give me a budget. And without it, then we're probably not the right sort of agency for you. So I love that, that phrase, the elegance of how you exit 
with Annabelle. And I think you can do it by just saying, perhaps at this time, we're not the right agency, but I'd love to stay in touch. And um, for me, the most elegant explanation would always be, we invest the majority of our time and effort in our incumbent clients, because nothing will make you want to become an incumbent client more than saying that to a prospective client. <laughs> Adam, I've just noticed the questions come in from Greg Lee. Would you? John yeah, Greg? yeah, I saw, I saw that. So I think Greg was, is, is talking about sort of those informal kind of uh, water cooler moments when sort of tips and suggestions get exchanged. Um, and obviously we're all suffering from a lack of sort of face to face uh, time at the moment. So it's the question is, um, are there any sort of tips in, you know, to get around this in today's working environment um, for those informal exchanges uh, that aren't happening like they used to? Um, I don't know if anyone's putting something in place in the in the digital world to make up for that. I'm happy to take that. <laughs> yeah. um, so a couple of things. I think now is the time to be really creative because if you think pre-COVID we had the norm and then wacky ideas. And I learned this from Stephen Grant, a comedian who gave a talk at the Brighton Chambers of Commerce recently. I don't know if anybody's from Brighton in the area, but so you had the norm and then you had these wacky, wacky ideas. And now the norm can't happen. We can't go into offices as we used to. So wacky ideas suddenly become much more possible so at very base level, networking, I went for a networking um, walk with Kate, an ER in Regent's Park near her office, convenient, we had an hour's walk, we were socially distanced and we covered a lot of ground, metaphorically and literally. <laughs> and so think laterally, don't regret what we can't do, be creative about what we can do. Some of it can be offline if you've got teams scattered around the M25, if you're London centric, then create meetups which are socially distanced and create those informal moments. And I'm sure a lot of you are doing that, but use your team's creative. We're in the creative sector here. Use your creativity to think, what can we do in this new world we find ourselves in? Don't hark back to thinking we don't have the water cooler at the moment anymore. Mm. Yeah, I think that the um, the walking meeting is something that we've, we've everyone's just really embracing now in our business where we can um we had one yesterday where we we turned it into a fundraiser where we got all of our directors out walking and raising money for calm uh, to uh, support suicide prevention so we were turning it into something that actually had more of a purpose to it beyond what you know we were going to be talking about in we'd, we'd broken into groups and and it's at the moment, I think it's it's serving this dual purpose of, you know, everyone came away from that walk and from the other walking meetings that, that we've held. And you just feel that you've had a bit of a boost to your own mental health. I think resilience is incredibly important for us as we, you know, start to move into what looks like the next phase of, you know, potential lockdowns, you know, more local restrictions and, and what have you. So I think that sense of connection, which is a really important pillar of mental health, is feeling connected, finding other ways to do it. The, the in, informal sort of walking meetings is, is a great way to do it. You do get out and you you just feel better afterwards as well as having been productive. Yeah, no, I think it's all, all useful. And, and just from, from our side as well, just from a practical perspective, some of the things that we've put in place is, um, you know, we use Slack as a sort of uh, messaging channel and uh, that, you know really changes the dynamic I think the conversations you have with a client because it's a bit it can be a bit more informal and you don't have to sort of send lo lots of emails that are quite uh, you know formal so that helps um, and we also run a, a sort of business development community and we've used the breakout function in in um, in zoom so I don't know if anyone has ever used it but it just means that you know obviously a lot of people don't like talking in a big open forum and that it enables small teams to get together maybe share ideas so there are sort of digital versions of, 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 the, of the physical world that you can put in place to encourage, you know, some of that sharing. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of other sort of creative, you know, solutions like Annabelle was referring to that, that you know, you guys can, can come up with. Um, another, another idea I'd add is for those whose teams are dispersed, to, for leaders to look at whether they can tap into co-working spaces. And whilst you might not be sat next to your own team, encourage people if they are using those services to network with others within the co-working space, because then you do, you can buddy up, learn, mentor each other across sectors. And who knows, it might lead to new business, but use, yeah. 
we, we've done something similar, bringing um, clients together in, in, a, in a virtual world. I just, I just saw actually, um, so I just go back. So Tracy, just Tracy Henry just said doing social, social cocktail meetings with a couple of clients. I think, and I'm, I'm interested in Kate and Malik's views on this. We, we take every opportunity to bring clients together. Um, you know, um, generally under Chatham House rules, but we also do use it for marketing purposes when, when we're allowed to, and get you know get clients to come together and just you know chew the fat over issues of the day, whether it be industry, marketing, generally, um, make it informal. Um, those I think those things are, are very very possible using Zoom. So yeah, just thinking about how you can bring your individual clients into a wider community within the agency. I think it's a great idea because you know we're all facing challenges and issues that we've never we've never faced before, yeah. and there's no there's no kind of perfect solution. There's only you know how how can you best approach some of these challenges and sharing just I just think the process of sometimes sharing the experience is helpful mm -hmm. in um, where you can find some commonality in the difficult parts, but also that there is actually some solutions that you can learn from other people. So I think that sounds like just a, a great option to, to bring people together, at, particularly at the moment. Who knows what next challenges are facing us in the next few months? Who knows? Greg mentions coaching curiosity. Um, you know, how do you do that when we're not in the offices together? But you could, I mean, one thing I think we did years ago back at Three Monkeys was to have a bingo card and to um, score points when you found out certain things about clients. And you can have to drop them into the conversation to find out have they run a marathon, have they travelled to Azerbaijan, whatever it might be. And you create that kind of fun around it as an agency, but you could involve clients in that. They need to find out about you too. So really, hard. you've got this creativity, just itching to use it, use it. Um, okay, I want to get on to talk a little bit about um, measurement. Um, I do have a, a quick poll to launch. I don't know how much we're, we're going to learn from it, but... Uh, it's basically asking you which five characteristics are most important in, in client agency relationships. Um, I've got 10, but it, it's, it's going to be hard for you to pick the right ones out, but I'll, uh, I'll launch that now. And if everybody could, uh, could participate and uh, maybe just pick five, <laughs> oh, you know, see, see which ones people deem as the most important. You guys got that? Adam, can I take this silence to do a blatant commercial plug for Amec if we're going to talk about measurement? Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. I'll go for it. Just, just to let everybody know that AMEC, which if you hopefully will have heard of, the Association for Measurement and Evaluation in Communications, um, the global trade body, is running a series of workshops. There is one this afternoon, if anyone has got energy for another webinar, where myself and uh, Alex Judd, who used to be head of Insights at Grayling, are talking about um, three O's and an I, which is talking about the difference between uh, out outputs, outtakes, outcomes and impacts, and how you might include that in your client's measurement journey. Um, but there is a series of webinars that have been produced and will continue to be produced through AMEC up into measurement month, which is November. Um, and if anybody is interested, then just head over to the AMEC webpage. Um, and uh, that would be fantastic. Commercial breakover. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure if the poll really worked. I, don't, I didn't get any votes through. So <laughs> I think we'll move swiftly on from that, that point. I don't know whether it's, I don't, it wasn't set up correctly or... Uh, or, or just no one bothered to do it. But uh, either way, <laughs> we're, we'll move swiftly on. Um, so measurement, uh, what, so what, what, what should we uh, be putting in place in terms of measurement? You know, I, I work with a lot of agencies and often there, there's, there's, no, there's no measurement. Sorry, Fiona, I, I don't know what happened with the poll. It, it literally didn't register one bit of feedback. Maybe we'll be more successful with the next one. Um, but yeah, sorry, Andy, um, or, or Anna, but anyone really, um, what what do you put in place to sort of ensure you're measuring the strength of those uh, relationships? 
Well, I, th I mean, Annabelle is from from a relationship perspective. Let's not get on some campaign measurement because you'll have me here for three hours. No, 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 Cam not campaign measurement. <laughs> no, not campaign measurement. I think relationship measurement. I mean, I would absolutely do another commercial plug for what the work that Annabelle does. Um, you know, the the pulse check that we run every year with our global clients, you know, is a pretty heavy lift for us. You know, there's, we've got about 160 clients, you know, across 10, 10 countries, and we poll them um, individually. Uh, we're doing it right now, actually. It's live right now. But it is absolute gold dust in understanding where we stand with, you know, in, in the client's eyes in terms of our relationship, the work that we're doing, everything. And I would strongly urge anybody who is, you know, from the agency side to, to look at how can they poll their clients um, and measure the, the success of the of the you know, of the relationship. Um, in, at the very least, ask for feedback, but do it in a in a disciplined way. I know Annabelle will jump in and tell me the best way to do that. But um, honestly, just ask your client the simple question: can, How are we doing? I mean, that's what it comes down to. It's asking the question and being non-defensive. Um, so thank you, uh, Andy, for the plug. And oh, shucks. Um, yeah, asking good questions and being non-defensive when the feedback comes in. And often those who are most afraid of asking the questions probably have most to fear because they've been gatekeeping some other stuff. Um, and I'm sure most of you are already doing this, but asking your clients what they think and feel about your services. You've probably got a traffic light system in place at the very least, I'd suggest that. So at your weekly meetings as an account team, is it a, a red, amber, green? Um, and if it's a read how did it get that far it should have got to an amber at the at the most um and then putting some rigor and measurement and discipline in place is obviously you know the bells and whistles can come but at the very least just make sure that you are checking in with your team is this client on track is it meeting the objectives the kpis is there a sense that the client's in a good place and then you can delve in and start doing online pulse checks polls whatever you call them you can set up your own you can come to me and ask me about them but to not be doing it, you uh, will be potentially missing those who are on the fence, as we talked about earlier, the latent grumblers or those on the fence who might be just starting to look elsewhere. And I do some NED work and I've talked to a couple of uh, other NEDs. And uh, what we have seen is that clients, because they've gone through so much change in the last six months, they're actually looking to uh, some of the inertia that can come sometimes around being with the same agency um, and they've had to restructure and perhaps look at budgets, it, they're just shaking the tree a little bit about what they're happy with and what they want more of or less of. And so now is a really good time to get under the skin of what your clients are feeling and thinking and what they, what they um, and how you understand them. So start small, put something in so you can start to see some change. If you measure it, you can, you've got a chance of, of managing it. Mm -hmm. So interested you, Kate, then, in, you know, because Annabelle talks about sort of shaking the tree and agency or clients looking at new agencies and having to, you know, innovate and adapt. Um, you know, where does, does measurement, is, you know, you've worked on both sides of the fence. So does it normally come from the client leading that measurement or do you find the agencies lead on, on the measurements? Um, where, where, where's the impetus? I don't know that I've ever really seen quite a, a consistency of one or the other. I think, you know, the good agencies will go out and do exactly what Annabelle is talking about and ask the questions. Um, I think that is a really, really sound practice for both sides because it can just sometimes be that catalyst. And, and often I think doing it, you know, in a way where you're not having to face your account team. Uh, because sometimes people feel, oh, maybe it's awkward. I might hurt someone's feelings if I give this feedback. But to do it in a way that enables them to be uh, just really honest about how they feel. Um, I tend to think that it's probably a little bit more procurement led when it's coming from the client side. That that's, a, you know, it's not a bad thing. I think so long as it's happening, it's, it's always good. Um, but I think... People sometimes, certainly in the in-house uh, comms world that, you know, I've experienced over the years, you're kind of just focusing on, on, you know, getting done what you need to do and you're not really taking the time to measure the relationships of your suppliers. It's more the outputs and the outcomes and how's that going rather than the relationship side of it as well. And I think that it is a really critical thing. You know, we talked about the value of, of chemistry right at the outset of this discussion. Um, and that's where those, those uh, I guess, opportunities to, to delve into it will, will come to the surface. 
Um, mm. It can surprise you sometimes what those what those uh, what, what Annabelle can dig out actually of your <laughs> relationships. Because I've I've like <laughs> like Andy um, worked with Annabelle on agency side to get under the skin of you know what what, what my clients are thinking. And uh, you you think you 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 know you, you've got a pretty good relationship, and then you just find there might just be one person on the account team that's really you know giving them the irrits, mm-hmm. and it gives you the opportunity to find out why and what's going on. So it's, it's hugely valuable, hugely valuable exercise. I mean, is there a bit of an art to this then? I mean, maybe for one for you, Annabelle, and I don't know about you, Malik, in terms of how, you, you know, you get involved with measuring uh, relationships, particularly on the chemistry side, which I presume is even more complicated. But um, yeah, like, what, what's the art of, of getting to the truth, um, you know, of, of the answers that you're looking for? Uh, handcuffs, usually. <laughs> No, there you go. <laughs> seriousness. At the beginning, when I left Three Monkeys and launched Question and Retain, I I kind of made it up as I went along, and it was a it was a test and refine what worked well, what generated a good response rate, what generated quality data, and by that I mean not only the quant in terms of how well an agency's strategic counsel or creativity or account management was was rated quantitatively. But what were they saying about that? And how do you phrase a question that really gets the best out of um, that exercise? So um, I forgot what your question was. Uh, <laughs> I was by the handcuffs and you were laughing. <laughs> how, how, do you, you know, how do you ask the right questions? Oh, yeah. You yeah. Get, uh, get it, the real answers, basically. Well, it's testing and seeing what comes back and you can refine that. So often with a client, a new agency will start with a, a core of questions, which um, we would always advocate asking because then we can compare them to our benchmark of what good looks like. But every agency is different. It's got its own culture. It's doing different stuff. So ask questions that relate to what it is you, you need to find out. What have you got a gut feel for? And what's relevant and topical to your client? So have you just acquired an agency? Have you um, just launched a new product or service? Um, have you got a new team doing something whizzy? So is your client interested in feeding back on that? Sometimes not at all. And so you need to create questions which are relevant to them, but which give you useful intel. So there is an art to it, yeah. It, and it comes back to anthropology for me and psychology. It's, it's really trying to get under the skin and understand, put yourself in their shoes. Mm. And do, do you do it in person or, or are there like online tools that you normally advocate? Uh, both. So the Royale is always to talk to people, as Andy said, face to face, if not by phone, you know, doing a top tier interview by phone mm. is incredibly valuable. And, you know, if, if online is gold dust, then by phone or face to face is, is the platinum dust, if that exists. Um, but the online tool allows you to go out to, you know, several hundred, several thousand people. We can go out to 10, 15,000 people if it's uh, for a client. But for agencies, yes, we'll go out to their hundreds of clients in different languages um, and get anything between a 45 to 75% response rate, which gives you a really indicative response. Mm-hmm. And even if you have a silent client, you can bet your bottom dollar that they're thinking some of the things that that 75% might have said. And then there's a whole art with what you do with those silent clients, which Andy and Kate are very familiar with. <laughs> I think the one of the really critical ingredients is having someone who's independent to ask the questions, mm-hmm. to not have people you know, invested. Someone who has that independence and who has you know the ability to to delve and ask the probing questions and to ask the follow up question, but someone who is not part of the team working together and when you've got that independent person coming in and they're not invested emotionally in it uh, or in any other way it's just that it allows them to be very very clear in identifying the issues and those pain points so I think that independence of of person who who is running that for you is is really critical. Malik do you ever play that role? Yeah well as I say I mean we're not obviously we're not truly independent but that's how we like to um to describe ourselves to the to the brand teams and also to the agencies because I think you know it's um, to answer your first question, Adam. I think the most important thing is first of all creating a safe environment because it doesn't really matter what the questions are if people don't feel that they're able to give an honest response. You know, you you won't make much much progress in in my experience. So I think it's making sure that there's clear, if you like, rules of engagement between the agency and the and the brand team in terms of each other's responsibilities, what the the repercussions might be for 
bad performance and also how jointly we will celebrate good performance. Yeah, so we should be lauding you know, things that we've done well together and not just picking on, on the issues. Um, because to be honest, that's normally when procurement get wheeled out. Mm. And that's where we get our fantastic reputation that I understand that we have across the industry at the moment. So, so the good and the bad is, is really, really important. And also recognizing the facts and from, from what I've seen across, you know, a number of um, issues over a number of years, it's, it's normally our fault. Yeah? Or probably two thirds of the time, it's the client's fault um, that there is a problem with the relationship. The other third would be the agency. I'm not saying that there is never bad behavior from an agency perspective, you know, but normally it's the client. And actually the way that you need to view procurement or the way you need to view organizations such as Annabelle's is actually, this is a vehicle for you to drive improvement in client behavior, whether that's how you write briefs, how you provide feedback, how you just behave in a meeting in terms of the requests that you're, that you're making and how you're, whether you're being respectful and not confrontational. I think it might have broken the survey survey by putting five votes in for confrontation in that last poll <laughs> you put up. Um, but that for me is is really, really important, is recognizing where the, the balance of the responsibility um, might see. But absolutely, that's a key role for, for procurement for me. Mm. Go on, Andy. Just to, I just want to uh, applaud Malik for, for what he's just said, because you know, in all of those those criteria, there wasn't anything around actual performance. Now, performance obviously is is everything, and if you're not performing, I'm sure Kate would be the first to say, if you're not delivering what you what you're setting out to do, then we're going to have a problem. But I really appreciate, from a procurement perspective, you know, an organisation. Oh, oh, sorry, hold on. Um, an organisation that places such emphasis on that relation on those relationship measures. I'm sure all of the agencies on the call. Have had clients, you know, where you, you've started work, you've gone through that that qualification process. Maybe you started with a, a client who's since left, and somebody new has come in, and they don't show the respect to the team. Um, you know, we've had cases of bullying um, where we've actually fired the client because we won't stand for it. Um, and I think if there is a, you know, if procurement does take that role. That where, where, that where it is a safe space for the agency who, who wants to keep that business, needs to keep that business, people's jobs are at stake by keeping that business, that they can go and have that conversation where, you know, clients are being unreasonable. And also where if the agency is being unreasonable, it's not, it's not one or the other, it's both. I think that's to be applauded. Um, so thank you, Malik. It's good to know that you guys have that, that uh, philosophy. It's, Andy, you've just reminded me of a story uh, where we had a client that, who was bullying one of our um, senior team, actually. It was a, a guy bullying one of our female senior team. And I had great pleasure and I knew he was playing golf on a Saturday morning and I knew he was teeing off at nine o'clock. So I phoned him at 8.59 <laughs> and I said, I'm very sorry that it's come to this, but we're, we're going to have to part company. We, we no longer want to be your agency. And there was this silence and then I just heard this thwack as the ball went and the phone hung up. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't the phone that he, he put on the tee. No, it was just the thwack of the ball. Oh my god, I laughed about that. <laughs> but yeah, it's a difficult thing to do, but you have to protect your team, absolutely. Um I've yeah. just as Angela's come on as written in the chat, Angela Law, about loving the focus on independent research. And particularly what she said is that um it, it can actually open up incredible opportunities and new propositions for agency, which is spot on, because in asking what your clients feel and think, you've also got the license to then say, well, what do you want more of, or what do you want less of? What are you looking for, what innovation? So those kind of questions can open up a whole discussion. It becomes your sales pipeline. So being probing with the right, uh, again, it's finesse and elegance to get the, the right answers, but that should support your new biz um, sales and marketing efforts for the next six months when you've asked those questions. Mm. Um, so I'm going to move on to, to pitching shortly. I did actually, my colleague actually got the results from the last poll and sent them to me. I didn't see them, but I got them here. So 93%, the biggest response was listening. That was the main uh, characteristic. That, that, oh, that's at the top of the list and that's a research trick. Oh, there we go. See, Annabelle knows the insight. Don't, don't ruin it, Annabelle. God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> um, the second was trust, which uh, came at 79%. Uh, third was transparency. Uh, 66 percent and then I kind of respect knowledge honesty all kind of uh, sort of fell fell in next um so yeah uh you know 
no shockers there. Um, so I've got another poll here about measurements, um, which I will launch now. It's just to get a feeling about how effective you you know do you do you do any measurement have you got anything in place to do it a little you know are you do you feel that your measurement is effective uh, in 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 how you're assessing uh, your relationships so just get a feel for um how how much people do again i i can't see results but i'm imagining my colleague does so i'm going to ask him to uh to to possibly um let me know when all the votes are in You're going to do another ad break, Andy? <laughs> no, we've got to move on from Andy's ad breaks. They're uh, taking up too much time. They're not, they're not very creative either, so uh, no. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll end the poll now. I presume everyone's voted as it takes sort of two seconds. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll ask my colleague to, to share, share them with me so shortly. Um, but yeah, let's get into sort of how, how firstly we avoid pitching, because I presume... Do we want to pitch? I mean, sometimes pitching is, is probably a necessity. Um, I, I, you know, I hear stories about statutory pitching, which I think, Malik, I'd like to hear your views on that. Like, do, do, do brands have to pitch every three years? Does the incumbent always have to pitch? Um, and how, how do we kind of avoid it altogether if we need to? So in my experience, there is no obligation to have a pitch every two, three years, whatever the frequency may be be you know um people may claim to have policies that say that i mean you you may need to review the relationship obviously you should review the relationship on a regular basis you know based on some of the things that we've been talking about um already but to formally go out to pitch every two three years no i mean i read you know in campaign and other publications you know there are some agencies that have been with their clients for 100 years um, so I'd be interested to see how they've been through 50 pitches in that in that period of time, but certainly not from my perspective, no. Mm. And we should be encouraging not pitching. We should be retaining agency relationships because pitching is disruptive, it's expensive, um, mm. and you should be able to find the capabilities within your incumbent agency. Mm. There's something we've been asked to do, which is a preemptive strike, I suppose, which is to do a two-way pulse check to understand what client and team and procurement are thinking and feeling at that moment in time ahead of the anniversary of the um, tender uh, the pitch being won and that can help open up the conversation and actually prevent a pitch even becoming necessary so preemptive strike I recommend yeah or a non-competitive pitch so we would do um, quite often a non-competitive pitch saying look you know either we have new products new requirements going into the next period um, you're our incumbent agency. We'd very much like to see your proposal, both in terms of capabilities, um, but also a commercial proposal, um, because we want to avert going to a pitch, as you said, Animal. Mm. Yeah. Has, has anyone been able to sort of deter that? I don't know, Andy, have you ever seen that where, you know, you've been invited to, you, know, you, you, you managed to avoid the pitch or being able to retain a relationship before it's got there? Um. It's relatively rare if you get if you get the email or the phone call to say that we're you know we're we're doing an agency review, um, you know we will try our very best to convince the the prospect that they don't need to that they should just come to us, um, but it's pretty rare that you're successful in doing that. So by that time it's probably gone too far. I think what you know as new business people, if we can build relationships with a group of target prospects. Um, you're far more likely to get through the door and close a piece of business without a pitch if you've got a strong relationship with that prospect, um, you know, to start with. We, ha we have some pretty clear guidelines globally. We, you know, we, and with greatest respect to Malik, if we're contacted by procurement, cold, from an organisation that we've heard of, but we have no relationship with, and the only point of contact is procurement, and we're not allowed to speak to the communications team or anybody in the organization then um we will probably decline to pitch because nine times out of ten it is a preordained um result it's a beauty parade and we're not willing to put ourselves through that it's a really tough call it is for the guy who's in charge of new business because there's some pretty you know chunky prospects that have come across our doorstep recently that we've turned down but you've got to be true and you've got to realize that you're going to put the team through absolute hell and back to try and win something that you're just never ever going to win 
So my advice would be have a really effective marketing program, know who you want to work with and look to ways in which you can build relationships with those individuals. It might narrow down your funnel, but that funnel will be of a much, much a higher quality and you'll have a much higher conversion rate. Um, and then the last thing I'll just quickly say is I would be interested actually if there was an opportunity for a poll, which there isn't, um, with the agencies on the call, um, how often do you re-pitch for a piece of business? I might be able to add that in, Andy. I'll, I'll, I'll have, I've not had much success with the polls today, but I'll, I'll try with the next one. Um, okay. And then, so, and what about UK in terms of, um, you know, pitching and trying to avoid that pitch? You know, do you, do you, does the incumbent always get invited back to pitch? Are there opportunities for them to sort of avoid it altogether? And, and what's the sort of influence of procurement as well from the, from the other side? I mean, my personal view is I think the incumbent has earned the right to pitch. Now, whether they decide to take that up is, is a matter for them. But I, I do believe that you owe them you, you owe them that much to allow them the opportunity to pitch. Um, there are some pitches that we, we, we're, we're publicly owned. So we're, we're using public money. And so we go through the OJU process. Um, so, uh, but those are for our really big kind of, you know, the marketing budgets that go over three years. So, uh, and, and it does work for both sides. I think what we, we endeavor to do, and we're fortunate in that some of the people in the comms team have that agency experience as we really make sure that the people writing the brief have come from agencies and they're able to put together a really solid brief. We do narrow it down so that we're not wasting anyone's time. But I think we also we take a very open mind to it. So if if we find throughout that pitch process that someone comes up with an idea, we like the idea. It doesn't quite nail the brief, but we like the team. We think that they've given us some really good, you know, creative inspiration. Then we look at how we might, you know, be able to work with them on, on another project. So I think you know take take the long term view, and it is about relationship management. Um, so hopefully, hopefully you are getting the, the opportunity to, to repitch. I think I would challenge that if, if you're an incumbent and you're not, um, that's, it's, it's just not great from a relationship point of view. If, if you're not being offered that, that opportunity, you should absolutely challenge that. Yeah. Um, okay. And, um, and like, are you seeing, you know, is there a big appetite at the moment to, look out outside of your current agency roster just with what's gone on at the moment um you know i think annabelle talked about sort of shaking the tree but you know is there do you see that from lner's perspective or even just you know the industry in general um does there seem to be more opportunity what, what what we're looking for is you know our, our the agencies that we're working with have had to be incredibly patient with us um since march um, I think when I was cut off earlier, when I lost Wi-Fi, uh, I was sort of talking about the fact that we've had to really change our business model from encouraging people to take these lovely journeys on, on our route to, you know, for a while there, just not traveling and then welcoming people back and reassuring them that it's safe. And so what that has done is really all of our plans, basically, from the start of the year, all just being torn to shreds. And so we've needed um, to have agencies with us who have been able to be patient with us and work with us. We've needed agencies that can deal well with ambiguity. Um, that will be something that I think continues to be uh, a real trait that, that we look for in our agencies, agility and flexibility, because the environment just keeps changing on us, guidelines change, and we, and we go across England and Scotland, so at the moment we have differing restrictions in Scotland as we do in England, and that just becomes very, very difficult. You know, at one point you had a situation where if you were on one of our trains leaving London, when you got to Berwick, you'd, you, you didn't have to have a face mask on, you do now, but back Back then you didn't, but as soon as you got to Berwick, on went the face masks and, you know, for the next time of your journey, you had to wear it. And likewise, coming from, from Edinburgh down or wherever in Scotland. So this, uh, you know, uh, I think agility and, and ability to, to, to work with, you know, ambiguity is something that, you know, we're looking for, whether it's existing or, or new relationships with our agencies. That is going to be really, really key. Mm. Yeah, so that sounds like a tough brief for an agency out there. For, uh, for, for, for that one. Um, and, and, uh, Adam, uh, there's a question coming from Eleanor around mm. pitching via Zoom. So what's everybody feeling about that um, ability to engage when you're pitching via Zoom? Yeah, 
I, I think you can do it. You just need to, I think we've all been brushing off our Zoom skills. <laughs> um, and, but, you know, there's, oh, I think everyone is also, you know, getting a little bit of Zoom and Teams fatigue and, you know, it's okay to do, you know, go, go a bit analog if you like, pick up the phone and have a conversation, which can be a lot more relaxed. You know, there's other ways to do it, you know, try and have, you know, a couple of you meeting for that walking meeting and, and do a bit of chemistry that way. But I think um, I wouldn't be, you know, put off by doing a, a pitch via Zoom or, or Teams, uh, but I think it does force you to exactly to your point earlier, Annabelle, around, you know, look, you're creative people. How can you use that creativity to drive some innovation, different ways of, of you know, working that, that pitch process? Ellen, have we answered your question? I, there were two or three parts to it. Come back to us via chat. <laughs> um. That's fine. Look, I know we've got we've got a, we've only got about sort of seven more minutes, and I know um, my my connection is definitely being unstable at the moment. Um, so for it, it implodes. So I'm just interested, Malik, in in terms of your your perspective there, in terms of um, you know you, the pitch process. And Andy talked about sort of how he, they want direct communication with the marketing team, and and you know I've I've had experiences myself where you know, the procurement team get involved in, no, that, that will not happen. But you've obviously talked about building chemistry. So how, how do you ensure that sort of there's a best practice across all, all Bayer's pitches? So um, one of the things that we've started to do or been doing for a little while now is actually approaching the pitch process differently. So moving away from the beauty parade um, where you have, with all due respect, the most senior agency people presenting beautiful PowerPoint slides, but then they disappear and the work is never run. Um, what we do now is we compress the entire pitch process into one day and we have it as a workshop. So um, obviously this is pre-COVID times. You get everybody together. Um, you deliver the brief at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, you then work together because obviously the best work that you produce will always be co-created between the agency and the client. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, you may even have some assets and some work that you can that you can put into test. Because, you know, obviously, if you nail it, if you come up with something on that day, fantastic, it's a bonus. But it's more about the process of um, establishing chemistry between you and the agency team, both directions, understanding where the capabilities are. So is the smartest person in the room the uh, the junior um, staff member that you referred to, Eleanor? Um, because this is the opportunity for you to really to get to know them and to make your decision. Yes, obviously based on um, the capabilities and and the requirements that you would vet up front. Uh, all the commercials, of course, I couldn't I couldn't uh, not mention them, um, but largely based on the chemistry as well, because you know you will work together and co-create. The work that you ultimately run and, and do you, who comes up with the short list of, of the agencies to come on on the day is it is it something that procurement lead or does it, is it collaborative discussion beforehand or how does that work so we i mean we we facilitate the process is the phrase i would always like to use rather than lead you know i think procurement led pitches is um always has a negative uh, connotation you know we we would try and understand so what are the capabilities that we need i mean three made basic um, parameters. What are the agency disciplines we're looking for? Where do we need them geographically? Is this local, regional or, or global? Uh, and do we need offices in those various locations? Because obviously that will have a big impact on, on um, the choice of agencies we have. And really importantly, um, how and where do we want the integration between the disciplines to take place? Do you want the agency to do that? Or are we going to do that within our own organization? Because that also means that you look at different types of agencies, individual best in class, or looking for integrated um, agencies where you need to have one person pulling it all all together. Mm -hmm. So, and we would do we do like RFIs, obviously RFPs and things up front to shortlist. We'll look at previous case studies. We'll collect some of the commercial data up front, um, reviewing contract terms and things like that to get to a shortlist. Because obviously the workshop I described is quite time intensive because you're talking about a full day for each agency. Ideally, you do that with two, maybe three agencies, but any more is just is unsustainable. And it's, it's, it's obviously working. How long have you had that in place? Is that brand new? Uh, we've been doing that in different, in different guises. We've been doing that for about five years now. So we've right. um, done it in quite a few, in all the different divisions at, uh, at Bayer, yeah. 
what, what advice would you have to someone who is pitching and is working with a procurement team who is less understanding of the value of marketing and chemistry um, and, and possibly being, you know, quite difficult in that process? Talk to the people that do value the chemistry. So we'll walk away from the pitch. If it becomes that extreme, but I would ask to talk to the decision maker. Mm. Um, you know, so we talked about the questions that you ask at the beginning of a pitch process when you're invited. Why are you pitching? Who are the decision makers in the process? Who am I competing against? What's the budget? You know, what are the objectives that you're trying to, to address? Um, you will know um, from the answers to those questions whether um, it's something that you want to invest the time and effort in. Mm. I also think it's incumbent upon, you know, if your um, client side that you need to be working with your procurement team very, very early on before you even start to, you know, write, write the brief, I think, to, to work with procurement because sometimes you'll, you'll find that, and Malik, I, love, I absolutely love the process you've just talked about, so I'm very enlightened, and, and I think particularly for a creative brief, I think it would work really, really well to test that kind of quick thinking and creativity on, on, the, on the hoof. Um, I think sometimes you come across people who are not quite so enlightened around the creative process and marketing and comms being quite different to, you know, other large scale procurement, um, particularly in some of, you know, the, um, I guess, operational type businesses, manufacturing and those sorts of you know, heavy industries where they used to, you know, procuring really big contracts around perhaps infrastructure or something like that. And then we come along with a, oh, we've got a PR brief. <laughs> and so it's very, very different. So I think it's about, it's hugely incumbent upon, and I would encourage anyone, if you're able to educate your clients on this, to please work with, you know, your procurement early and, and discuss the ways in which, you know, what you're going to brief out is going to be quite unique, perhaps, to other parts of the business. Mm. Um, because you can influence, you, you can influence the procurement process. I think people tend to use procurement as this, you know, excuse or smokescreen for everything and blame it all on procurement. And that's rubbish. You can influence the procurement process entirely. So, but you've got to get in early, I think. <laughs> Yeah, and it's about build, building relationships with, with them as much as anyone. Um, let me, uh, so I did, we did, a, the poll on measurement uh, was basically, I, we got back about most people saying they need to do a lot more and only sort of 12% saying that they do a, a decent job or it, it's effective. So it's clearly we've got quite a bit of way to go with, with that. Um, I did have one on, on sort of pitching um, and whether or not people feel the pitch process is actually improving um or or not at all um so i'll just quickly throw that out there and get the responses uh to that can i do a um homework commercial break so have some homework for everybody yeah yeah i'm gonna do another poll but you you crack on okay so my homework for everybody is to after this meeting make yourself a really nice cup of tea or coffee and then get a giant piece of paper, write down all your clients and put red, amber or green next to each of their names. And then ask your senior team to all do the same. And then have a gin and tonic on a Friday afternoon and go through that and see whether you concur or not. And if there's mismatches, then that's when it can get interesting because you'll have different views on the same clients. So traffic light homework, cup of tea today, gin and tonic Friday afternoon. See where that takes you. Classic. Any other last uh, last comments from the from the panel? Just that it's been great to be here. Thank you, yeah. and I would love to have more interaction with uh, people who are interested in this subject. So please feel free to get in touch. Happy to soundboard what you're doing already, and um, yeah, I'm there for you. Yeah, just yeah, from my side, thank you. It's great to have Malik and, and Kate from the client side to get that perspective. Lots of really interesting insights, um, and likewise, happy to answer any questions, any follow-up anyone might have. Um, so thanks for the invitation, Adam. Yeah, right. very much ditto that. Uh, please connect on LinkedIn or, or any other way if you'd like to get in touch. It's, it's, I've really enjoyed the discussion. Um, re really worthwhile yeah, discussions. Food for thought. Good. Thank you all for, for being part of it. And uh, yeah, we'll hopefully do it, do it again next year or so. Um, and we'll speak soon. Cool. Get the kettle on. Take care. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.